The book of Acts is the first book of the Bible following the Gospels. In your Bible, if you'll open there, it's probably called the Acts of the Apostles. It only mentions a couple of the many apostles that were in the New Testament church. Obviously, Paul being the main one. Peter was there for a bit, and John was there in a little of the book. But it's really the acts of the Holy Spirit. So that's what I'm going to refer to it as, the actions of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church. And the book of Acts is to show us what Jesus does after he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. The book of Acts shows us how to act as Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, living this Christian life. And many Christian people kind of approach their Christian life as separate from, let's call it their regular life, right? Many people who are Christians, they believe in Jesus, but they say, you know, in church it's all good, I love it, but then I have to go to the real world. Well, what if the real world was your Christian life? where the Holy Spirit was at work in you and through you, and you expected God to use you, not just in church or in spiritual moments, but every day, no matter where you are. That's what the book of Acts is all about. Now, Caleb and I are gonna teach together over these next few weeks, and when you'll probably jump in some, and who knows what else might happen as we go through these many chapters. And we're going to try to talk about two chapters every week. So the challenge is going to be what we don't talk about. Because there's so much. And we could really get lost in every chapter for more than a week. But we're going to pick out a few highlights and try to bring some understanding to the book of Acts. In verse 1, the writer Luke We know that it's Luke because of how he wrote his writing style compared to the Gospel of Luke. And also, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he wrote to the same person, this guy named Theophilus. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, the former account, he's speaking of his Gospel that we call the book of Luke. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. So really, we could say Acts is what Jesus continues to do and teach, right? So in the gospel, what Jesus began to do and teach, and now what he continues to do and teach, but now he's doing it through us. He's doing it through the church. He's doing it all over, not just through his one life. This guy, Theophilus, Fun study, those of you who like to do research, get your, get your uh, phones or iPads or however you do your research, and take a look at Theophilus. It literally means God lover. Theo, God, like theology, the study of God. Theo and Philus is lover. So was it all people who love God that he was writing to? Maybe. Was it one person, he calls him most excellent Theophilus. Some would say he was a leader in the Roman government. And Luke was writing to teach him about Christianity and help him understand the benefits of Christianity in every city and every community. You know, in the first, the first century, as in most centuries, Christians were looked down upon and persecuted heavily. That continues today. And maybe... More now than ever before, even in our nation, which we call one nation under God, Christians are the most hated group across the world, the most persecuted group. Well, that was true in the first century. Maybe Luke is trying to help Theophilus understand how the church helps people and brings goodness to a community. Or maybe Theophilus was a political leader. Here's an interesting thought. Maybe Theophilus was a man that Luke had worked for. In the early first century days, 
Most doctors were servants or slaves. There was no schools of medicine. They were kind of developing and working on things as they went. A lot of what they did didn't help. So servants or slaves were considered physicians. Maybe Theophilus was a rich man, most excellent Theophilus, that Luke, a physician, had served. Maybe was even a slave under him. And then as he helped him, and maybe as Luke became a Christian, he was released, and then Luke ended up traveling with the Apostle Paul. Man, these are interesting thoughts. You can find them as you research, and uh, lots of different theories on things like that. Kind of fun to look at. But let's get to the important points of the book, and we'll start in Luke, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Being assembled together... With them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So interesting dialogue here and setting the stage for why we call this the acts of the Holy Spirit. Though so these guys, the disciples, the 12 and others who were close to them were already born again, right? They believed in Jesus. Jesus had rose from the dead. They believed that he died and rose again. So that means they're saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you're saved. So they're Christians. They believe. They're following Jesus. And yet the Lord says, you can't go anywhere yet. Don't go into all the world yet. Wait in Jerusalem until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, if 12 disciples who followed Jesus, who saw his miracles and actually did miracles, and were now being released as the pillars of the church, if they need the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? You know, through the years, I've met so many people who said, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need that Holy Spirit stuff. I beg your pardon? You don't need the Holy Spirit? Say that again out loud and listen to yourself. This is why your kids think you're stupid. Because you say stupid stuff. No, every Christian, obviously all people, need the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, wait, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples are like many of us in today's Christianity. In verse 6, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They had this idea, the Jewish community, that somehow God was going to put them in charge of all the earth, that their little country there in the Middle East would rule over all other countries and that they would be the nation in control from a political sense, a financial sense, economic, in every way, they would rule the world. And many times we Christians kind of get that idea. We need to take over the politics. We need to take over the economy. We need to take over the media. We need to take over Hollywood. We need to be in control and be in charge. And we're thinking of it in that natural sense. Now, it's referred to in the media today as Christian nationalism. That was never the purpose of God. God is never setting up Israel to rule the world in a natural sense. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, he wasn't talking about politicians. He wasn't talking about media or the economy. He's talking about a spiritual kingdom 
where from the heart and by the spirit, we rule, we reign, we rise above, we influence, we impact. Recently, I said to one of my friends who has a, a large church, very influential church in his city, not here in the Northwest. I said, bro, you should be mayor. He said, ah, oh, that would be a demotion. <laughs> Through the years, I've had people make jokes with me about getting into politics in the state of Washington. That would really be a demotion. <laughs> God was never thinking natural kingdoms. He was always thinking the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We're not waiting to take over the presidency or the governorship or any other political power or economic power or media power. We're ruling and reigning in Jesus' name with our influence in the spirit, with our presence and our power. We're doing things that are way beyond political. What difference if you make a law against bad things, but people are bad anyway? Well, that's where we come in. We can change hearts. We can change minds. You don't have to change laws if you change a heart. It's good for us to influence our politics. It's good for us to influence political leadership and the laws that we have. That's all good. We should and we pray for our leaders, and we should. But if your heart is right toward God, the law doesn't matter to you. That's why Jesus, through the New Testament, says, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, righteousness, against such there is no law. I don't need a law about adultery or abortion or theft or murder if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm loving God. I'm loving people. Those laws are irrelevant to me. I'm living by a higher law, the law of the spirit and the law of love. So if you think we need to be Christian nationalists, we need to pick it and we need to fight in the natural realm with politics and these other issues, you're actually lowering your sight. You're missing the real power that we have as Christians. But these 12 disciples, even after three years with Jesus, listening to him teach, watching the miracles, they're still stuck on this idea. Do, do we get to take over as Israel now? And the Lord's like, really? Let it go, bro. Wait and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you'll begin to understand. Your power is in the spirit, not in politics not in media, not in money. You have greater power. It's by the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen right then? Amen. So he says in verse eight, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now wait, they're already born of the Spirit. They're already baptized in water. They believe Jesus is Lord. Is there more? Oh yeah, there's more. You'll receive power when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to see this several times throughout the book of Acts. They were born again, and then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Two separate experiences. You can be born of the Spirit, but not filled with the Spirit. You can believe in Jesus, but not have that power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. The word power in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is the Greek word dunamis, dynamite, explosive power, miracle working power. We're going to see a man stand up in the next chapter, Acts chapter 2, and begin to preach the first message in the New Testament church. You know who it is? Most of you know. It was Peter, the same guy that a few days before denied the Lord, cursed and said, I don't even know who he is. That same guy is now standing up and preaching to the same people who crucified Jesus. What changed? The power of the Holy Spirit. I think in our world today, we hear a lot about anxieties and fears and worries and stress and depressions 
and all the mental health issues. But if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have power to rise above those anxieties, to rise above those challenges, to overcome the sicknesses, diseases, mental or physical or emotional, whatever they might be. We're not saying they don't exist. We're saying there is a power that's greater. And by the way, how much confidence do you have in a God to get you to heaven if he can't help you while you're here on earth? I'm gonna run that by you one more time because I don't think some of you have thought about this. You believe he can take your soul and spirit out of your dead body and raise you up to heaven where you will live for eternity, but he can't fill you with enough power to overcome the problems here on earth. I had a friend passed away years ago old time preacher, he used to say something I would never say. He said about some Christians, if all your power was dynamite, it wouldn't be enough to blow your nose. Now I wouldn't say that. But if you have the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet you're struggling, you're sick, you're worried, you're tired, you're stressed, you're How in the world do you think God's going to get you to heaven? So Jesus is saying to these disciples, all right, boys, and there were girls there too, don't go anywhere until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be witnesses. Now, here's the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life. Not just to make us feel better, but you'll be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other uttermost parts of the earth. So our Jerusalem is here, Federal Way or Kent or Seattle or Tacoma, wherever you live. That's your Jerusalem. And then Judea, that's your state. We're in the state of Washington. The Lord knows we need some light in this state. We need some influencers. We need some power of the Holy Spirit in our state. Come on, somebody. And in our nation and in our world, the uttermost parts, right? So that's the real reason that we have the Holy Spirit in our life. So some people say, well, I don't need the Holy Spirit. I don't even believe in that tongue stuff. I'm not into that. I don't want any of that. Do you not want to influence? Do you not care about lost people? Are you really living with family members and coworkers who are lost and going to hell and you're gonna let them go? You know, I've heard more than one worldly person, ungodly person say, if those Christians really believed they were going to heaven and they let all of us go to hell and don't even talk to us, how much do they believe? It's a good question, isn't it? If you're not even talking to your own family about heaven or hell, how much of the Holy Spirit do you have in your life? Because Jesus said, you'll receive power and you'll be a witness. What does a witness do? A witness tells their story. A witness says what they saw. A witness says what they know. How much do you witness for the Lord? Last week, we had 515 or so people who prayed with us for the first time or first time in a long time. And I thought about all those people in that altar call because somebody brought them. Those weren't people who come to our church all the time. They were here at Easter because you brought them. You invited them. You cared about them. You want them to know the Lord. You know there is an eternity and you are a witness unto them. Well, how many more could we all reach if that power of the Holy Spirit flowed out of us to be a witness? How many votes do you think I got in high school to be the pastor of the year? <laughs> You're right, not one. How many votes do you think that I got to have a turnaround, to be successful, to rise up out of my anxieties? Not one. 
I got no votes for anything because nobody knew me, nobody saw me, nobody cared about me, which is the way I wanted it because I was out behind the gymnasium doing stuff I didn't want them to know that I was doing. <laughs> and then two years after high school, I meet Wendy, we're in Bible school, I'm in a rehab program, and two years later, I'm the pastor of a church and I'm on television six days a week. And in 1983, we built our first sanctuary. You saw a picture of it there when I had red hair, more hair. 1983, we opened the largest sanctuary in the Northwest. And then we were building again and then again, and then we built here in Federal Way 16 years ago. How did that happen? The kid out behind the gym smoking pot, barely getting through school, can't, can't get a paper done, can't get homework done, can't do anything, just trying to medicate the pain of my fears. How did that happen? That's what we're talking about. Power to be a witness, power to overcome, power to make the changes, power to live this life that God has for us. Maybe you keep saying, I'm scared and I'm nervous and I'm uptight and I can't lead a life group because it makes me nervous and I can't pray for my friend because I don't know what to say and I can't and I can't and I can't. Maybe you think this is about you. No, this is about the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through you and all you have to do is care. All you have to do is love somebody. All you have to do is want to be an influencer. And God will fill you with his spirit. And who knows what can happen once that takes place. So after Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit, he rises up. They watch him go up to heaven. And as he's going up through the clouds, two angels appear. So it's the, it's the disciples, Mary, Jesus' natural, half-brothers, and, and a few other folks, and they're just watching him go up. And two angels appear, and they say, why, why are you looking up? He's going to come back in the same way. But go and be filled with the Spirit. Let's go. Let's do what he's telling us to do. Now, again, we in Christendom spend way too much time trying to predict when he's coming back. Who cares? You, you have a brother who's dying and going to hell. You have a cousin who's struggling against cancer and can't overcome their own anxieties. You have a neighbor who's killing himself with alcohol. And you're worried about when do I get to leave? What if right before the altar call every Sunday, I was like, man, I'm tired. I've been here all morning. I'm out. They can die and go to hell for all I care. <laughs> right? I mean, why are we here? Why are we not dead? Why did I not die in umpteen car crashes and several overdoses? Why did I wake up on the bathroom floor with syringes in my arm and blood all over the place? I had friends who died. Why did I not die? Well, because the Lord saw there would be a day when I would get filled with the Holy Spirit and I would be right up here every service saying, if you're not born again and if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, lift up your hand because we're going to pray right now. Right? And we've been doing it for 44 years. And today, Wendy's preaching in another church and Caleb's preaching in another church. That's why I'm alive. What are you alive for? Well, I'm hoping to get some new wheels for my car next month. Really? Is that it? Well, and, and, and I want a new bathroom too. Come on, man. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your vision. Get a little bigger purpose. Be filled with the Spirit and be a witness. Well, chapter two. 
The day of Pentecost came. Now, Pentecost means 50, right? Just means 50, like Pentagon, five sides. Penta, five. The Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. So it was a Jewish feast. It was a Jewish holiday. Jews loved holidays. They had a holiday every 50 days almost. And this was a big one. Right after Passover is Pentecost. So why do we call some churches Pentecostal? Because they believe in the experience that happened on the day of Pentecost in the first century where they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So the day of Pentecost had come. So Jesus died at Passover, rose again. Three days later, 40 days, he walked around teaching, having fish with the guys, hanging out, showing up in the room. Boom, the doors being closed. 40 days, he taught him, and then he rose up. 10 days later, so 40, he was here in his glorified body. 10 days later, the day of Pentecost came. They're waiting. The 12, the mother of Jesus, Jesus' half-brothers, and several other people is a total of 120. They're waiting, and they're praying, and they're seeking God, and they're saying, fill us with the Spirit. Send us. They don't know what it is. They can't read the Bible to figure it out. They're just, they're just trying to remember what he told them. Fill us with the Spirit. Send the Holy Spirit, Lord. 10 days they're praying. Now, I know folks who can't pray 10 minutes. Maybe that's an issue. So 10 days they're seeking God. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in chapter 2 and verse 1, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them tongues as of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all, the twelve, the brothers, Mary, Women, 120, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is the beginning. This is the New Testament church. This is how we roll. This is what we do. We believe in Jesus. We are baptized in water, and then we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's for all. Right? People say things like this to me all the time. Well, Pastor, how, how will I know if I'm ready to be baptized? Well, do you believe? If you believe, be baptized. Well, how do I know if I'm ready for the Holy Spirit? Jesus said this, these signs follow them that believe. They'll speak with new tongues. Well, well I don't know if I believe. Well, settle that. You need to settle that. Stop saying you don't know. Make a decision. Make a choice. Okay, so people say this to me pretty regular. I've been at it a while, so I got a lot of stuff people say. <laughs> so people say this. They say, I'm not going to pray in tongues because I don't do anything I don't understand. Are you listening to yourself? You really need to think a little more. Okay, first of all, are you married? I'm pretty sure you don't understand your spouse. <laughs> How many times has your husband or your wife done things and you say, I have no idea what they're doing? <laughs> you don't understand, and yet you sleep with them every night. <laughs> you do not. Do you have children? How many times have you looked at your child and say, Whose child are you? <laughs> you don't understand. But not just that. You turn on the lights, and unless you're an electrical engineer, you do not understand. You don't even know the difference between one of them old light bulbs and one of them new LED light bulbs. I don't know. And yet every day you turn the lights on. You don't understand how your car operates, even if it's an old fossil fuel burner. <laughs> unless you're a mechanic, you don't understand. You just turn the key. And if it doesn't start, you don't know what to do because you don't understand and yet you drive it. It's only when it comes to God, all of a sudden, you become this deep thinker. <laughs> well, I just don't do stuff I don't understand. You liar. 
You lie like a rug. What it is, it's an intellectual argument to resist God. I'm glad to have a God that's beyond my understanding and that works in my spirit. And when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, God begins to speak through my lips in a language that is heavenly, that is spiritual, that is beyond what I can understand, but I trust him. And I can pray the perfect will of God even when I don't know what it is. You know, sometimes if you knew the will of God, you would mess it up. You'd get in the way, right? If God came to me years ago and said, you're gonna have this sanctuary, you're gonna have that sanctuary, but it's gonna take 40 years. I would be like, I'm going back to smoking pot. <laughs> 40 years, oh Lord. No, but God knew, and every time I pray with the Spirit, I pray the perfect will of God. It's a way of surrendering even your tongue. You know, the New Testament in the book of James, it says, your tongue is set on fire by the course of hell. But when you pray in the Spirit, your tongue is used for the perfect will of God. So they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, men and women disciples uh, or apostles and not. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now here's a unique partnership with you and the Holy Spirit. They spoke with tongues. He gave them utterance. Through the years, Wendy and I have prayed with thousands of people to be filled with the Spirit. One of the things that we see happen oftentimes is people are waiting for God to make them speak in tongues. God will make you speak in tongues when he makes you tithe. When do you think that's going to happen? When he makes you submit to your husband. Yeah, we know that ain't going to happen. In other words, God doesn't make you do stuff. He teaches you. He calls you. You have to surrender. You have to trust you speak with other tongues, and then the Holy Spirit. So what happens is it's kind of like when you push off from the shore in a sailboat and the wind catches the sail. You got to get going. You speak with other tongues. And I remember that first day I was born again on Sunday morning, baptized on Sunday night, and right after the water baptism at our church, it was at the Mill Creek campus. Uh, back then it was a different church. So on Sunday night, I've been, I've been saved for like 12 hours. And Sunday night, we're praying for the Holy Spirit. And I start speaking in new tongues. And at first, it was awkward. It felt weird. I'm like, oh, I must be making this up. And then all of a sudden, it started to flow. And I've been flowing for 40-some years. How old is church? 40 four years. Wendy and I married 46. So that's like 48 years ago. Damn. it's a long time ago. Right. So you can say, well, well, I, I tried to speak in tongues, but I'm waiting on, I'm waiting for God to make me do it. No, he's never going to make you do it. You speak with tongues and then he gives the utterance. It's a step of faith. Yeah. It's a step of faith. And they all spoke with tongues. And throughout the New Testament, Paul would meet people who acted like Christians, but were maybe a little, something was missing. He would say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Paul knew some people believed in Jesus, but had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. So same with us. Many of us are still trying to work it out and trying to get in, trying to find a way. Don't make it too complicated. You know, it's kind of like if you get married young, you grow together, you learn together, you grow up together. If you get married for the first time and you're 50, it's going to be a lot of change because you've been doing it all your way for all these years. And now you got to share everything. Whew, that's why the Bible said rejoice with the wife of your youth. lest you suffer with the wife of your old age. Yeah, that part's not in there, but. 
Now, isn't it something that the Holy Spirit came in two forms, wind and fire? Now, Jesus told the disciples, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm singing with Willow, my granddaughter, yesterday. Fire, fire, flow over me. I can't remember the words. She knows all the words. And in that song, Cece Winan is singing, and she stops and she begins to quote Acts chapter 2. And Willow is quoting every scripture. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place with one accord, and the Holy Ghost and fire. And she just, I'm just looking at her and going, go, girl. What do you suppose is going to happen to an 11-year-old who grows up quoting the scriptures about the Holy Spirit? Well, this girl's already overcome some things. And I just believe that fire, mm, that fire shut up in her bones. So wind moves us. Everything that wind touches, it moves. It moves the trees. It moves all the leaves onto your yard. It moves. Wind will move the sailboat across an ocean. When you get the Holy Spirit, he starts moving you. I believe he moved Wendy and I together. He moved us into ministry. He moved us to birth our church and to do what we're doing in the Northwest. The Holy Spirit. Maybe you feel like you're always on your own. You're trying to figure out, what should I do? And I feel like I'm all alone. You need to get the wind in your sails. You need to get the Holy Spirit. And you get up every morning and you're like, Shika rabato, so kuriata la la bataya. Wo rabaka shanda la la By the time you get in your car to go to work, you got some wind that's guiding you, that's directing you, that's empowering you. And then he said, fire. It was like fire set on each one of them. Fire changes everything it touches. Now, it doesn't change everything the same. It takes ceramic and makes it hard and usable for so many other things. Clay, can't really put your salad in there. But once the fire hits it, that clay becomes a ceramic bowl that will hold so many different things. Fire will also melt the wax. Fire changes things. When the fire of the Holy Spirit hits your life, people will start saying things like this. He's changed so much. It's amazing. I knew him years ago. He's a different guy now. Yeah, that's what happens. When the fire is burning in your spirit, the wind will move you. The fire will change you. And the Holy Spirit starts causing you to be a witness for Jesus everywhere you go. And you may be say, you know, I'm not very spiritual and I'm never, you know, going to be that kind of Christian. I'm not that kind of guy. I don't want to be in that. I'm not going to have a life group. You know, I don't want to talk to people about the Lord. You don't know who you are until the wind and the fire starts working in your life. Okay. I'm running out of time, but don't go away because there's more. <laughs> chapter, chapter two, verse 14, Acts two fourteen. Peter, Standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Now, who's this guy? The same guy who denied Christ just a couple weeks ago. Now he's standing up, preaching, bringing the word to the very same people that crucified Jesus. This is a serious crowd. These guys will stone you. Peter's not scared. He's got fire. He's got wind in his sails. These are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will have visions. Old men will dream dreams. On my men servants and my maid servants. Come on, girls. I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. That's what the book of Acts is all about. The fulfillment of the prophecy originally given by Joel, restated by Peter, and now acted out in the remaining chapters in the book of Acts.
So let's believe the Holy Spirit is working in us just like he did in the book of Acts. We got that same fire. We got that same wind. We got that same power. You shall receive power. You are not scared. You are not weak. You are not down. You are not anxious. You are not worried. You are not less. You are powerful because the Holy Spirit has filled your life. And if not, let's pray this morning. If it's not happened in your life before, let's pray now. And we're going to add our faith to yours. And this is going to be the beginning of a new day, a new spiritual life, a new season for you. Let's close our eyes together.